Honestly, this has to be one of my favorite songs from Bumblefoot. The Day After, it's called. Oh, it's beautiful. And it's good for building up the UFO talk tonight with the fedora wearing John Hudson as we're going to start off with all of the hype last week brought on by the Howard the Duck UFO. Yeah, well, first off, uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for, for hanging out with us. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, you know, I, I think in many ways this whole phenomenon over the last couple of years, especially what's been going on in social media, is going to end up being uh, probably several masters and a couple of PhDs for some psychology and psychiatry students. Because um, what you have is you have these glaring examples where, um, you know, I'm just glad it's not great evidence. Because if it was great evidence, I'd be really upset about what's going on. But people are just fighting over it ridiculously. And people are basically picking on one little thing that they think is wrong with it and blowing that way out of proportion and then trying to use, this, use that as an argument that the entire thing is 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 debunked. And uh, no one has the data. I mean, it's like, yeah, you can glean some things. Um, you know, you can glean some things from what's being shown. But um, I, 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 people are just coming to these really quick, quick, quick conclusions. You got people arguing that because of the way the plane was was circling, that the, the, the drone was actually or whatever it was, was actually going like, you know, 15 miles an hour and it wasn't going, you know, 100 or 200. You have people arguing all sorts of crazy stuff. And they're just. It, it's just one big echo chamber because you you can't prove anything. I mean, it's it's um it's uh, so I you know I just kind of focus on the duck aspect of it because I think that's really funny and you know it's like yeah it's as good good thing to focus on as anything else. So what's new with it? I mean, here this video comes allegedly from Homeland Security, and what do we know about it? We know that's the thing is we know very 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 little. Um, I mean, the best thing we have is is Dave Felch basically, like I said before, did this really great, you know, eight minute um, thing, and and he did reach out to the the guy that released the video. Um, he did evidently. Um, he seemed to imply that he uh, might have actually been in contact with the person who filmed it, which um, I, I I need to double check with because I wasn't really sure that I that I I understand what he said correctly, and I don't have a relationship with Dave Felch, so I need to I need to f find a way to reach out to him and and check on that, but. Um, you know, essentially, it's the same thing with every other video we get. We get one video, you know, we get some indication it's an official video. Okay, it's an official video. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that what's on it is officially recognized. It just means that the video itself is official. Uh, personally, I think until the SCU or someone like the SCU comes out with a with a nice, deep report on what they were able to gather and what they were able to do, um, I think it's... I think it's really, really challenging. But to put it in perspective, you know, I saw one site, one uh, 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 show, which I, I won't name because I don't want to pick on them because I, I like the show. But they spent two hours debating this. Right. And you could get more out of Dave Felch's eight minute video about what actually happened than you can could in that entire two hour program right because people are just spinning their wheels and they just they're so desperate to fail it in one way or the other and it's too early i mean it's like it, we just got the video it just it, it frustrates me to no end but has it is it, entertaining has this video been confirmed by anybody with uh, u.s government ties yet so I have not seen this in writing, which is what I, which I'm, I'm, I need to dig for. But essentially, my, my understanding is that um, that Elizondo said that he, he, his understanding is it is an official video. Um, he's not super excited about about what's on the video, but he does. His understanding is that it is a, it is an authentic video. Well, that's very interesting because I'm surprised that the major media hasn't picked this up yet. You know, they've been all over the videos so far, especially recently with Jeremy Corbell. And it just seems like, you know, maybe the, the source who got this video didn't really have the, the popularity or the muster as somebody like Corbell does, but I'm really surprised they haven't picked this up yet. Um, so, so I, I, I would argue two, two different things. I would say, I would argue that someone with Corbell's uh, ability to, um, to present material like he could have presented this in a way that it would have got a lot of attention. But I would argue that essentially if it had been a better video, it wouldn't have mattered who presented it. It would have got a lot of attention. The problem is this video is it's boring. I mean, it is boring. And I mean, essentially the only part of it that I find interesting 
is is the consistency of the color. That's it. I mean, it, it's the consistency of the color as it travels, the, the consistency of the color throughout the object and the consistency of the color around the object. And the fact that this did not change as it changed speeds, as it changed altitudes, anything. To me, that's, that is the only thing about this video that's actually really, really interesting. And that is interesting, but it's not like, you know, I, I wouldn't run to, you know, my editor and go, oh, wow, look at this, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's sleepy. All right. Do we have any new updates on the Einstein story? Just a couple little tidbits that I just wanted to pass on just because I know so many people are, are kind of as in, interested in the case as I am. So um, uh, a friend of the show, Thomas Fessler, did a, 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 a basically an interview of, um, of, of Anthony Br uh, Brigalia. Is that right? Brigalia? Brigalia. Am I getting close? Yes. Yeah, thank you. And um, – once again, sorry, Anthony, I'm trying. Um, and uh, uh, so he was on uh, Thomas's uh, festival show the other day. And so they had a, a really nice conversation. I'll post a link to it. I encourage everyone to watch it. And so we learned a couple of new things. One, we, I learned that one, that the story that I'd heard before about why um, Anthony, uh, uh, Anthony Brigade was talking to her was not correct. It was because he likes to read old books and look for things that weren't followed up on. And he read the book that um that mentioned this case where where her name was was a pseudonym and he basically you know discovered that while he couldn't get her name he was able to get the name of, of the of the mufon researcher that that interviewed her and so he went looking for her and he actually he actually called every single woman in like a tri-state area with that name you know every one of them i mean i don't know how many he called but he like he he called a lot of people Wow. And he just found her. I mean, so he he worked for this, but it was more intentional than I than I realized. Um, and so, but I thought that was that was just interesting how much work he put into it. Um, uh, the the researcher, she um, turns out she is actually somewhat willing to talk. Um, so if, if someone wants to reach out to her, um, and talk to her, it, it, you're not going to, the door's not going to be immediately shut. Um, but she doesn't, she doesn't want any fanfare. She's not looking for any press. She's, you know, she's, I think she's, I believe she's 80 years old. Um, uh, it, it took her quite a lot of convincing to, um, to release the, the videos to him. Although once she agreed to do so. She was the one that on her own took the weird format they were on, which I, I don't even I didn't even recognize the format. It was called a stick. I don't know what a stick is, but take it and from a stick format and got it converted to MP3 for Anthony and, and handed it to him in MP3 format, which was really cool of her. Um, she's still looking for the third one, um, you know, hoping to get it. And um, but um, but I encourage everyone to listen to the interview. Um, and then the, the only other thing I'll, I'll pass on and. Um, you know, if it was any other case, I wouldn't because I have I have no evidence to show for this. But um, all I can say is I, I have a friend who um, who knew well um, some of the contemporary physicists that were alive at this time. And um, and he basically said that he personally feels that he has proof that essentially Einstein was not the only physicist invited, that it was basically the bulk of the uh, Manhattan Project physicists that were invited. Um, so that, uh, you know, Teller, Feynman, um, Wheeler, um, you know, uh, you, the list goes on that there was quite a lot that, that went. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to track down all their assistants, track down all of their helpers, look at every, you know, canceled dentist appointment, every canceled this, every canceled that, and look for gaps in anyone's schedule that we can match up because there's got to be breadcrumbs about this one. No kidding. And I think this is a story where, you know, anybody who's into sleuthing evidence and, and researching, I think there's something here. I really do. And I really would encourage anybody out there to maybe contact the, the university that has the documents and, and the files of, of Einstein's work. Maybe there's a diary in there that says something about this. We don't know, but it is worth the shot to see if there's more to this regarding yeah. Einstein especially and Roswell, yeah, yeah, especially because if there if there were multiple physicists there, and you can find the physicist that was not prominent at the time, they might not have been watched as carefully, and they may have made more indications of it in their own journals or their own notebooks, or to their to their to their you know you had to get someone to cover your class for the week, right? There's got to be evidence of that, right? I mean, there has to be there has to be breadcrumbs. Hundred percent. 
fully agree with you. All right, let's move on to the next topic. There's a letter about Roswell that was sent to Stanton Friedman as we continue the Roswell talk. What's happening yes. here? Okay, so so the reason why I'm I'm reporting this actually is not because of the letter. The letter itself is interesting, and and I'll provide a link to it, and everyone should read it. But the reason why I I find this story very interesting is because when I read this, I thought, well, they're not giving me a whole lot of information in this article. I, I'd like to read the actual letter, and so I thought, well, who knows who knows anything about Stanton Friedman files, right? We might know somebody, right? So I you know messaged um uh, Nicole Sackage, and I said, hey Nicole, you know do you know you know where this letter is. Can I see it? You know? And, uh, and she came back very curious. She said um, that, that, that she talked, she talked to Grant and, and they were, they were going to look into it because uh, according to the article, it was seen in some kind of, um, of a display of Stanton's documents that was, was available somewhere. And they're confused because they're not aware of any actual presentation of his documents that, that, that has been done. So, um, so Grant's, uh, Grant Cameron's been looking into it and they're trying to figure out exactly where this letter was seen and who has it. So, um, I, you know, I, I personally, I, I found that almost uh, as interesting as the article itself. What now what's said to be on that letter? Basically it's a, it's a, it's another first person account, um, passed on through two people, but basically, um, a, 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 a military person who was, um, was at the site and um, was uh, basically it's kind of an interesting story because basically he had um, he was a, he was a rare duck at the time and that he had experience with um, with jet power jet propelled aircraft. And so he was actually asked to take a look at the wreckage to figure out whether this was just a really advanced jet design that he hadn't seen before. And so he got to take a look at the wreckage quite closely. And basically what he came back to and said to them was this is not a jet. I have no idea what this is, but this is not a jet. So, so it's it's an interesting firsthand account, and and um, it's it's uh, it's definitely worth reading. But like I said, I'm almost more interested now in in finding out, you know, how did someone see this letter, and and why is it not a part of of Stanton Freeman's original collection, which is what you know Grant Cameron's been working on, right? So, uh, you know, I'm curious as to what, how this is going to turn out uh, as well. I'm very excited to see this whole new look into Roswell from a completely different angle, because this is one of those stories that's in the UFOs Pandora's box that continues to be need to need to be told. I really do believe that. Well, and, it, and it's, it's, it's like the, sorry, sorry, but just real quick. It's like, it's like the Einstein story in that there were so many people involved. There were so many people involved in Roswell. There's the, 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 the network of strings that you can follow back for that one. Uh, there's got to be a lot of data out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, let's continue on. We're all wondering, did the Seawolf USS Connecticut submarine hit Megalodon or just a piece of rock underwater? Well, I'm only voting for Megalodon because I like you, Dave. Um, you. Uh, <laughs> But um, it is a, it is kind of an interesting case. Now, um, if you read the the great, great article that the Drive just put up, which I'll provide a link to, they went and talked to a, um, a, a, a you know a sonar type um, a expert that had spent you know much time in the in the nuclear subforce, and um, and he 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 gives an interesting explanation of the combination of um, of high frequency um, uh, near field detection they have versus the topological um, maps they have, and how in the South China Sea there are so many subs around there and it's such a a, um, a heavily populated area that the near field detection uh, usually isn't used because it's actually detectable at twice the range you get from it so if, if you can look out 5,000 yards with it it means someone can detect you 10,000 yards away so it's not something you want to use in a populated space and so it's very possible that they just um, they were using you know accelerometer map data and they they got skewed a little bit and they hit something they weren't supposed to at the same time, this is not any submarine. This is a Seawolf class submarine. Now we should have ended up with a bunch of these, but because of budget cuts, we only end up with three. So this is one of the three most advanced, incredible submarines yet built by man. I mean, these are amazing devices with amazing capabilities. The fact that it just ran into something um, is is it's it's disturbing. And um, and what's interesting is that the the Chinese government. Is also very interested in what they hit, 
and is um, is asking through formal uh, lines of of, uh, of of communication a formal report on what they hit. Um, everyone's quite curious. Um, I, I'm hoping it was something organic, but um, but you know it could be something you know UFO-ish too. I mean, and it could just be a a, a big giant rock that moved. I guess I I don't know. I will say this: I'm very sorry for the sub commander. Um, I I don't think I don't think his command will survive this this event. Probably not. I mean, but considering the facts, they're in a hostile territory between Taiwan and China. They're obviously in silent power going through there and trying to be as quiet as they possibly can, damn near invisible. I mean, the chances of something happening to this and looking at the photograph of the damage caused to this, it's yeah. amazing this this submarine didn't sink. I mean, literally about two thirds of the front end has been ripped off. I, th that's one thing I'm going to go dig into. I want to find out, is that, is that really, cause I didn't think that thing was up on dry dock yet. So like, I'm curious, is that really the actual picture of that submarine? Because that damage that that's in that picture, that's extensive. I mean, that, that is <laughs> boy, man, I thought whatever, whatever they hit, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see how the other guy looks. Oh man. Well, John, great job as per usual, as we got to get on to the news, and we'll talk to you in a couple nights' time.